Charles Newman and the laity. His latest book, Conscience Before Conformity, Hans and Sophie Scholl and the White Ro Rose Resistance in Nazi Germany, appeared in February 2018 on the 75th anniversary of the White Rose Trials. He is currently completing, and I personally find this an absolutely tremendously exciting project. I'm very glad it's being done. A critical edition of Newman's University Papers, my campaign in Ireland, parts one and two, forthcoming, actually it says here, forthcoming in May and October, 2021. I'm glad to say that Daniel has helped me with up-to-date speaker notes. I'm assuming, Paul, this has now appeared and I need to order my copy as I urge you all to do immediately. <laughs> While the tech is being fixed, I will give us some idea of the ground rules. Our speakers have been asked to speak to 15 minutes. I will begin glowering at them at 15 minutes and throwing rotten fruit, which has been provided for me in a basket to my right at around a few minutes after that. So I do encourage everybody, please, to be punctual as best you can. We will do our three speakers here in order as I've introduced them, our two speakers online, and then we will move to questions from the audience and try and get a discussion going as best we can. I am now filibustering and hope Dan will just be Okay, it's working. The tech is working. Canola, would you like to start, please? And then just ask you. Ways is can people hear? And is one directing one's voice into the mic or into the owl, as it's called here? So if you um, can't hear, let me know. And we'll we'll talk to the owl about it. <laughs> so that's one minute gone. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to give you that extra <laughs> talking to the owl is a capture. At the outset. <clears throat> I'm kind of drawn to this owl, you know, I keep following the owl. <laughs> At the outset, I would like to thank Dan and Father Gary for organizing this conference and for including me as one of the speakers. And I'd like to welcome all of you here and also the people who are on Zoom. Some of my friends are actually on Zoom, maybe the odd member of my family. What I'm going to do in the 14 and three quarter minutes is very simple. I'm just going to look at what Newman himself said about his idea of the university. Then I'm going to reference one or two scholars as to what they say or what other insights might come from their comments. And then I'm going to have a few little remarks of my own, which may be relevant or not, but if they fall within the 15 minutes. Newman's journey to Dublin, as you all know, began with an invitation in 1851 from Archbishop Cullen of Armagh, soon to become Archbishop of Dublin. He asked to advise on the proposed establishment of a Catholic lectures would form the Dublin discourses, in time, the idea of a university. There was a total of nine discourses, five of which were delivered in Dublin. And in the opening sentence, and this is where Newman lays it out in his own brilliant uh, manner, in the opening sentence of the preface to the idea, Newman gives the essence of his university, and it's the following. The view taken of a university in these discourses is the following, that it is a place of teaching universal knowledge. This implies that its object is, on the one hand, intellectual, not moral, and on the other, that it is the diffusion and extension of knowledge rather than the advancement, rather than research. If its object were scientific and philosophical discovery, I do not see why a university would have students. If religious training, I do not see how it can be the seat of literature and science. Such is a university in its essence and independently of its relation to the church, but practically speaking, it cannot fulfill its object duty, such as I have described, without the church's assistance. I do not see, a, or to use the theological term, the church is necessary for its integrity. Well, that's Newman. Newman's argument in the discourses centers on the nature of liberal knowledge and on what he conceived to be the relation between knowledge and religion. 
In the first four, and in part of the fifth discourse, it is maintained that all knowledge is one, that each division of knowledge can only be fully studied in relation to the other, and that therefore the omission of theology falsifies the content. In the fifth and sixth discourses, the nature of liberal knowledge is developed. The grasp of many things are brought together into one, and Newman uses the term philosophy, and it seems to be Thomistic philosophy. Philosophy is knowledge of things in relation to one another. The end of the university is knowledge, and though it teaches theology, the university is not a church institution. Well, Dermot would certainly know an awful lot more about that. Father Fergal McGrath, in his classic study and fairly exhausting study, I remember going through it when I was younger, Newman's University, Idea and Reality, showed how Newman tried to translate his vision into practice. As fitting for one who considered that a man's life is his letters, McGrath relies extensively on the correspondence, about a thousand letters in relation to the university, mm -hmm. some with our friend Cardinal Cullen, and of course Professor Barr might have a different interpretation of the nuances. I might get an extra minute for that. Um, according to Donald McCartney and Tom O'Loughlin, in their introduction to Cardinal Newman at the Catholic University, they say it is a mistake to think that what Newman advocated was merely a sort of non-useful education in the classics and other liberal arts for gentlemen of leisure. They say that Newman recognized the need for professional schools. He established the medical school, proposed a faculty of law and appointed a professor of engineering. And then I was particularly um, interested in the following, that he further stressed the necessity for creating, quote, a school of useful arts, developing and applying the material resources of Ireland that is comprising the professorship of engineering, mining and agriculture. Now that had an echo to me of Sir Robert Kane. And <clears throat> it's possible that Newman had some knowledge of Sir Robert Kane, who wrote The Industrial Resources of Ireland, which was published in 1844. And the professor of chemistry in Cecilia Street in the medical school, W.K. Sullivan, had worked with Robert Kane in producing, I believe, sugar from beetroot. Together with Newman, Sullivan founded the Atlantis, a scientific and literary journal of the Catholic University and served as its editor. And later Sullivan would succeed Sir Robert Kane as president of University College Cork. Tutorials where a relationship can be developed between the student and the teacher. And of course, um, Paul Shrimpton is very, very uh, strong on this. Um, and would, would know a great deal about that. Um, some academics, for example, also Newmanites, Yaroslav Pelikan of Yale University, argued that research and teaching are inseparable as both intellectual, on both intellectual and practical grounds. However, as Ian Carr points out, Newman recognized the importance of research and the advancement of knowledge. What is not clear to me, and maybe other panel members or other people, will explain to me is this relationship between research and teaching. A great intellect for Newman is one that takes a connected view of old and new. And I've mentioned that before, which is worth repeating. He believed all knowledge um, linked in together. He did not oppose specialized knowledge or professional or scientific knowledge, but he did not consider them sufficient for um, as the end of university education. And he warned. Knowledge could lead astray without the guidance of revealed truth. Referring to the subject of political economy or economics, my own subject, somebody kindly described me as a historian as, as sort of a disguise, but I confess economics. Newman said, political economy is the science, I suppose, of wealth. A science simply lawful and useful, for it is not a sin to make money, any more than it is a sin to seek honor, a science at the same time dangerous and leading to occasions of sin, as is the pursuit of honor too, and in consequence, if studied, 
by itself and apart from the control of revealed truth is sure to conduct a speculator to unchristian conclusions. A good friend of mine who studied economics with me is here tonight, so we'll have a good chat over a cup of tea afterwards about our sinful occasions or the ones we missed. <laughs> now, the university was, was supposed to produce what you'd call gentlemen. And I'd just like to say the concept of a gentleman hardly gains much attention in the media today. But Newman's defi definition of a gentleman as someone who doesn't inflict pain actually rather appeals to me. And I quote, and it's a, it's a lo lovely description if any of us could live up to it. He is tender towards the bashful, gentle towards the distant, merciful towards the absurd. He never speaks to himself except when compelled, never defends himself by a mere retort. He has no ears for slander or gossip. Is scrupulous in imputing motives to those who interfere with him and interprets everything for the best. From a long-sighted prudence, he observes the maxim of the ancient sage that we should ever conduct ourselves towards our enemies as if he were one day to be our friend, which is the basic law of diplomacy. Just look at the world today, see who's fighting, who are friends, who are enemies. Newman's description of a gentleman crossed my mind in late summer, when the subject of freedom of speech and freedom of expression was center stage. I thought about freedom of speech and freedom of expression a great deal, but not come to a satisfactory conclusion. It seems that what's acceptable at one stage is not acceptable at another. And then it dawned on me <clears throat> that if writers, commentators, journalists, and others behaved according to the code of Newman's gentlemen, there would be no problem. As you all know, the Catholic University is a remote ancestor of UCD. And Newman did many things which carried over he founded a chair of English literature, one of the first in these islands. And Thomas Arnold was the first professor, the, the brother, the convert brother of Matthew Arnold. He was also the first to advocate uh, the inclusion of modern literature in the university curriculum. He also introduced night courses for students. And in the idea he described literature as the manifestation of human nature in human language. Newman himself changed in the course of his life considerably, and I think he expected his students to change. He said to live is to change. Newman did not hesitate to appoint a number of young, Island, young Irelanders as professors in his university. The most famous, of course, being Eugene of Curry, who was appointed to the chair of Irish history and archaeology. The first professor of political economy, yes, there was a professor of political economy, was John O'Hagan, a young Irelander, a graduate of Trinity College, and a devout Catholic who devoted much of his time to the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, which was after all a few years after the famine. In 1886, a few years before his death, Newman wrote to Gerald Hopkins, then a professor at the university and quite anti Irish nationalism, he said, if I were an Irishman, I should be in harsh a rebel. That was Newman who had opposed Catholic emancipation, don't forget, um, as, as a young man. Newman provided a billiard table for the students and allowed them to go to the He founded the Literary Historical and Aesthetical Society, now called the Literary and Historical Society, the LNH, for discussion and debate. And Newman's motto, taken from St. Francis de Sales, core et core locuter, still graces the note paper of the society. Heart speaks to heart. And I suppose I can say, you know, being a sort of a, a mother. Anniversary of the Ellen Tage that my son Frank was auditor and they had a great time. <laughs> um, I even got invited to a dinner. 
uh, sometime after Newman's return to England, the Catholic University was given into the hands of the Jesuits. And I just mentioned this, it's a bit by the way, but not everybody might be familiar. Joyce, of course, who's all over Molly, everywhere, Joyce, Molly, Molly Bloom, so on. Um, I suppose the most famous student. And he produced in this very room, drama and life, and the old physics theater. And several years, well, some years ago, uh, Tony Clare, who is a contemporary of mine, who's now sadly dead, Anthony Clare, the psychiatrist, he did a reenactment with other people. And he had been an auditor of the Ellen Tage also in this room. And it was, it was very, it was very memorable and it was lovely. So an exquisite feature of Newman's legacy is of course the chapel beside us. Um, he liked that style, the Basilica style. I think it was based on somewhere in Sicily. I don't think he was as keen on the Gothic. When he died, he was buried in Rednall in the grave of his fellow oratorian, Ambrose St. John. It was unusual for two men to be buried together, but he was absolutely loved St. John and said that St. John stood by him when nobody else did. And um, the motto on the grave, which I've seen and probably many of you have seen, ex umbris et imaginibus in veritatum, out of the um, shadows and images into light. Now we're nearly there. Since his death, of course, his influence has grown enormously, Vatican II, which was described as Newman's council. But more recently, Newman, and they're, they're very self-confident, the British uh, Newman. Um, you know, I won't go into the canonization, who went and who didn't, but at the committal or burial of Queen Elizabeth, um, the very end part of the sermon, they, quote, they read Newman's night prayer. Um, may he support us all the day long till the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and our work is done and so on. I had the good fortune to be at the beatification in uh, Birmingham in, in uh, 2010, beatification by, by Pope Benedict. And it was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, people from all over, all sorts of people there. And of course, a particularly poignant point was the, the vice postulation of the cause, Father Gregory Winston. His father, he was a convert, Gregory Winston, had been an Anglican clergyman first, and his father, Major Gregory Winston, had been in charge of Allied occupied Austria after the war. So it would have been within the Benedict world. And it was really amazing like to see the Pope take off his suketo for God's hift the cream and uh, you know, it was interesting. It took place on the, the anniversary of the Battle of Britain and the celebratory flyover. And in 1990, the centenary of Newman's death, I visited the exhibition in the National Portrait Gallery in London. And the, the, the exhibition filled five rooms. And of the 120, of the 175 items, two related to Newman's time in Dublin, a copy of the Dublin Discourses and a picture of the University Church, which he so loved. Now, next week, people will talk about the idea today. And of course, the context for education has changed hugely, but the essential transmission of knowledge, sometimes via tutorial system has not been abandoned. And let's leave the last word to Newman, who dreamed of his university being one day a seat of wisdom, a light of the world, an alma mater of the rising generation. Yes, oh yes, no one does. Right. You don't?
There we go. I'm not sure if that's going to So it's really good. It's a short break. It's all my books. I'll be tapped. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
going to try to say something about, especially as it was expressed in the Aufbau der menschlichen Person, sometimes translated as not yet translated into English, so we don't have a fixed title, but the structure of the human person, which is from 1932. So just before the Berufsverbot, and it was one of the last works she wrote before uh, she entered Carmel and, and couldn't write anymore because she was, she was Jewish. Stein had been baptized in, on New Year's Day in 1921 and was adjusting to the Catholic world. So she grew up a Jew, but in this adjustment period, which as all adjustment periods are often extremely fruitful, um, she chose to translate to ease her way into this Catholic world she'd adopted as a mature woman. Um, and one of the works that fell on her path was exactly the idea of the university. She was living at a, as, a, as a secondary school teacher in Spire at the time, so she also only had bits and pieces of time to actually do this work while she was teaching German and history. What she was trying to do in that area, in, in that era, was of course, she'd been formed a phenomenologist and she wanted and needed to bring this training in which she believed it had led her to faith. And she needed to bring it to a Catholic public which were a little bit skeptical about this. So she was looking for ways in which to explain <laughs> what it was about. Um, and as you, I hope, will see, the mm, most important ideas of Newman is what she is grasping and integrating into this philosophy of education that is about the structure of the human person. So as you see, the most important thing for Stein in any education theory is the understanding of the human person because education is ultimately only about that. And in that, I think she also was in agreement with Newman, although it is not so completely expressed in Newman. So you can also say that in the synthesis of phenomenology and scholasticism, which she is performing, um, Newman was a, a model kind of a model because what Angelo Bottona's wonderful talk some what, months back about the teaching of philosophy at Newman's university taught me was that Newman was before the neo-scholastic revival. It was so interesting to see, Stein is not, Stein is a, is a child of the neo-scholastic revival, which was new at the time. And that's really quite important. It was not new for Newman because it wasn't there. He wasn't, he wasn't accepting Thomas Aquinas because, because there was no Pope telling him that we, we should concentrate on scholasticism as a tradition, even in modern times. So Newman's vision was not scholastic. It was before the scholastic revival. Stein was not, but it was, it, she, understood the scholastic revival in a way we probably have a difficulty doing in Ireland in particular now as the most brand new thing you could have. Now take that, you can only see that in hindsight with um, Newman who, who doesn't have it, but he was a great stepping stone for her um, to get to assimilate it. But I don't know whether I need to say anything about Stein uh, really, because you may you may know or you may not know. So, um, the most important thing is to say that in all of her mature works, Newman and especially the ideas I'm going to show you now actually plays a very important role. And you can even say that the most her most distinctive idea, namely that faith plays an essential role for the Christian philosopher in our understanding of the human person she has primarily from Newman.
that work was um, written at the Deutsche Institut für Wissenschaftliche Pädagogik, the German Institute for Scientific Pedagogy, and they had asked her to teach a course on the foundations of Catholic education theory. And that's what she did. So she did two volumes, and I have sent them both around there. Um, one which is called The Structure of the Human Person, that's lectures on philosophical anthropology. And then one that's called What is the Human Being, which is theological anthropology, because she thought, and in that she also is an inheritor of Newman, that you can't understand the human being. That's why the human being in Newman's discourses is so controversial. Well, he says it's so controversial that you have to leave it aside to get, to get the, the university people to talk to each other. She grasps it and says, well, we understand the human being only if we have all the sciences to do it, including theology. And we can't understand the human being fully, even basically without that idea. And that's an idea she takes from me, I think. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense that she found it there. So, Einstein's later philosophy in general, these are the five ideas I think she brings from her reading of or translation of Newman's idea of the university. It should be comprehensible to natural reason that the Christian must in his or her philosophy acknowledge God and the kind of knowledge one obtains through faith. Now, the numbers I've given there are the numbers of the discourses uh, and sections uh, of the idea of a university. So for the non-believer, it should be obvious that the Christian must think that his faith matters for his engagement with knowledge. She also gets the confirmation, which is a very old idea. So she also has that, of course, from from the church in, in, in the broader sense of the, of the word, confirmation of the idea that faith is an intellectual act, um, the object of which is truth. And Newman says it results in knowledge. I think Stein possibly would, 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 would not stress that, but she certainly would understand the object of, true, of, of, of faith to be truth which is why it is a, it's an intellectual act. She also obtains confirmation of the, idea that philo of the idea of philosophy as the science of sciences. So Newman's idea of philosophy is that it is um, the science of sciences um, and the philosophical attitude is that we use all the sciences to develop. That, of course, is a very old Aristotelian idea, but it's very much a phenomenological idea as well. So it is an idea that reconciles for her ancient Christian and phenomenological accounts. Then this thing I've already mentioned, the crux of the matter in the world of university polemics concerns the philosophy of the human being, which is why theology needs to be there to properly do the rounds also the theological perspective needs to be there on the human being. And theology as a branch of knowledge is important for all subjects, including philosophy. So more narrowly, the influence of, of Newman on the structure of the human being. The formation of the, per the, formation of the human being is the purpose and center of all education and therefore of all knowledge. That's why you can't exclude theology because it has a key to who the human being is and therefore to the entire enterprise of knowledge. Whereas all education theory and practice relies on an idea of the human being, explicit or implicit, Catholic education theory rests on or indeed consists in a Christian anthropology, philosophical and theological. The Catholic faith proposes and supports what she calls a closed worldview, so finalized worldview, a complete 
maybe a better, a better way of stating it, in a metaphysics, a complete worldview in a metaphysics, into which the anthropology fits. This develops through the centuries along with dogma. And then something um, that she doesn't take from Newman, which she develops herself, maybe the church's mission to educate the human being for what concerns its very identity is what pushes it to propose Catholic educational institutions and to be present in all educational establishments because it concerns the identity of the human being. There are differences, of course. Newman is talking about liberal education, which will form gentlemen. Stein, of course, is one of the first women who enters university life, and therefore one of her uh, interests is to know how to educate women. Um, and I find it interesting how she translates liberal education into German. It's Freien Erziehung, which you'd have to translate back into English as free education. So, so she translates liberal as free, which is quite an interesting um, thing to do. Now, Newman is polemicizing and has a lot of rhetorics in his style. Stein has none. There's just not one polemics ever, ever going on. It's all synthesis um, and clarity. Newman sees there to be a role of the classics and the canon is important to form a philosophical mind. Whereas for Stein, what is important is the individual that needs formation. So the canon is not essential. Are you throwing eggs at me? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Another two minutes or so. <laughs> Newman thinks university education is a training of the mind by analogy with athletics being training of the body. To Stein, university education must explore the various understanding of the human being because that's the center of knowledge. Um, to understand the, their implications for the individual. Newman is insisting that we must not extend the sciences beyond their scope because then they start doing strange things. And Stein understand all sciences as required for understanding the human being. So the center, the central thing is really the human being for her. And that center is probably learnt from Newman. There is, there's a good, now it's learnt obliquely. It's because he says that it is always controversial and therefore people have a tendency to leave it out, that she realizes that that's actually why theology is needed. So just the very last thing here. Um, and since I didn't have a copy of the English, I had to retranslate it back into English, um, something on which they really do agree. This alone would be cultivation of the mind, which consists in the ability to see many things simultaneously as a whole, see each of them on the background of their correct place in the all encompassing under order, understand the value of each and determine their reciprocal tendencies. So thank you very much for your attention. And we will now just do the test on this time. Right. <laughs> I think that was a fairly good rendering back into English. It sounded vaguely fairly close, I think. Your translation and Newman's in English. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased with the, these two talks because I think they, they will connect very well together. I'm particularly glad that Fanula uh, mentioned this tension in Newman's idea between it being on the one hand an institution for intellectual perfection on the one hand versus uh, its perhaps uh, oblique religious goals. And in one of Newman's discourses that was not published in the idea, but which was published later in the campaign, uh, he said he, it was the original fifth discourse and he took it out and he put it in 
But in there, he describes this tension between um, the, what he calls the direct object and the indirect object of the university. The direct object being the perfection of the intellect and the indirect object being uh, the religious formation of the human person or the moral formation of the human person. And so I would like to address both of these objects of the university, the indirect and the direct. Uh, so first I'll talk about the, the intellectual perfection or the direct object or the direct objective of the university. Uh, and in short, I would say that the intellectual uh, goal of the university is to avoid two intellectual pitfalls. I wanna describe these two pitfalls. For Newman, any education that is unbalanced risks promoting two highly undesirable intellectual characteristics. The first is what he calls viewiness. He describes this as a superficial knowledge where facts are not related to other facts or subject areas, where there is no tracing what is known to higher causes or principles, where there is no connected view or grasp of things. It is all breadth and no depth. Now a variation on the viewy person is what he calls the inaccurate student. The inaccurate student is one who seems to know something about a great many things, but those things are flawed or superficial, and when tried, wanting. When pushed, they're found unstable. The inaccurate student is viewy insofar as he finds it hard to focus on one idea or to pay attention to details in reading. Those with an inaccurate mind might be pleasant in conversation and comment on a given topic with flair here and there, but due to intellectual sloth, they will lack consistency, steadiness, or perseverance. On a practical level, says Newman, among other things, and I quote, they will not be able to make a telling speech or to write a good letter. They cannot state an argument or a question or give sensible or appropriate advice under difficulties. And such a juvenile habit, viewiness or inaccuracy, is exacerbated, observes Newman, by the 19th century's cultural obsession with periodical literature. Newman writes, every quarter of a year, every month, every day, there must be a supply for the gratification of the public of new and luminous theories on the subjects of religion, foreign politics, home politics, civil economy, finance, trade, agriculture, emigration. The journalist lies under the stern obligation of extemporizing his lucid views, leading ideas and nutshell truths for the breakfast table." End quote. Uh, the more frequently things have to be published, the more young people are demanded to offer a view on this or that or the other. It promotes in them what Newman calls a reckless originality of thought. With a voracious appetite for constant media and stimulation, we have no time for or no stomach for, and consequently no capacity for, attention to detail and nuance. And would that Newman live today to experience <laughs> Twitter and the rest of it. Now the opposite of viewiness for Newman is the second educational risk for a university, namely bringing forth what he calls the man of one idea. The man of one idea or a man of one science is one whose specialization becomes the sole vantage point for viewing reality. The major interest of the man of one idea becomes the interpretive key for everything. Its principles become the measure of all things. The principle might be, all material being is made up of atoms, or a free market allocates goods and resources most efficiently, or we ought to pursue social justice. These might be true, but on their own become incredibly misleading. Persons of one idea are incapable of seeing reality from a different perspective. Whatever they say, though in its own place, true, is sure to become a great bubble and to burst, that's Newman. More nefariously, when in discourse with those who do not have a wider perspective than they, quote, they persuade the world of what is false by urging upon it what is true. That is to say, the world is easily deceived by them for what they say is not false and actually boasts of great success, usually corroborated by technological and medical progress whose impressiveness is its own justification. And if these problems weren't enough, the man of one idea is also simply a tedious and in the long run, exceedingly tiresome conversationalist. <laughs> the man of one idea and the viewy person are two types, two extremes that Newman seeks to avoid. Instead, one ought to seek accuracy without hyper-specialization and universal knowledge without superficiality. 
It seems then that we are at risk of spreading the butter either too thinly all over the bread or too thickly on only part of the slice. And for Newman, however, it is not about the student knowing a medium amount about all subjects. His solution is rather to develop a habit of mind that he calls philosophical. So Newman's ideal, a philosophical habit of mind. A philosophical habit is the acquired ability of interpreting and making judgments about reality as one complex but coherent whole, or in Newman's words, the philosophical contemplation of the field of knowledge as a whole. Perhaps the most important philosophical presupposition underlying Newman's pedagogy is this claim that reality is one. But the intellect for Newman cannot approach that one reality through an intuitive vision, but only piecemeal, and hence only through individual disciplines or branches of knowledge, all of which together form a whole system or a circle of knowledge. While Newman's inclusion of theology at the university and his defense of the liberal arts have garnered perhaps the most scholarly attention and controversy, it is actually his inclusion and understanding of the role of philosophy or what he calls the science of sciences that gets to the crux of what he understands a university to be about. Philosophy examines the scope and limits of each subject by relating them ultimately to one single coherent reality or being in its height, depth, length, and breadth. Newman explains, and I'm quoting now, the comprehension of the bearings of one science on the other and the use of each to each and the location and limitation and adjustments and due appreciation of them all, one with the other, this, I believe, belong, I conceive, belongs to a sort of science distinct from all of them. And in some sense, a science of sciences, which is my own conception of what is meant by philosophy in the true sense of the word and of a philosophical habit of mind and which in these discourses I shall call by that name. He also calls this a form of universal knowledge. Such a power, Newman says, is the result of a scientific formation of mind and is an acquired faculty of judgment, of clear-sightedness, sagacity, of wisdom, of philosophical reach of mind and of intellectual self-possession and repose. He calls it a philosophical condition of mind. Newman's use of the word condition goes here as well with his other analogies for the university. One's physical condition is helped by the doctor or the hospital. One's material condition is enhanced by work or the almshouse. And one's spiritual condition is the remit of the church. And one's intellectual condition is developed by the university. Contrary to the undisciplined viewy graduate on the one hand and the narrow-minded specialist on the other, the philosophically habituated knows that each method in its own sphere is good. She knows one method is not adequate to all inquiries. And so the philosophically habituated knows further that she has to be nimble enough to oscillate between the various methods and exercises of mind in order to enjoy some kind of vision of the whole. Her mental functions have to work together in concert to use Newman's expression. Now for some philosophical foundations for the philosophical habit of mind. The word idea is significant in Newman's corpus or in his writings. For Newman, all institutions are animated by an idea. Ideas are the life of institution, he writes. If the key idea of Christianity, for example, is the incarnation, the leading idea of the university is unity. This idea, let us call it the unity of knowledge, assumes a host of other presuppositions or more foundational principles, which Newman took for granted, even if many today do not. They are by implication the necessary principles for developing a philosophical habit of mind. Without them, we cannot develop this philosophical habit. And I just enumerate a few of them, but there are many, many more. But for example, one, reality is intelligible. Two, the intellect is made for reality and capable of knowledge of the whole. In other words, skepticism is, is out. Truth does not contradict truth. So there's no two source, two truth theory. Uh, there is a truth that transcends all truths, a being that transcends all beings, a foundational ground for all knowledge that unifies it because it is the cause of it. So he's doing first philosophy. This first cause is author both of reality that is intelligible and of human subjects who are intelligent. 
The list could be filled out more, but this is simply an indication of the principles involved and presupposed when Newman says that knowledge is one. Without classical theism and epistemological realism, there is no universal knowledge. And without universal knowledge, the purpose of Newman's university is dead. With these principles, however, the ambitious pursuit of integration can begin. One who works according to these enumerated principles of philosophical habit will think, learn, and judge differently than one who does not. When confronted with the infinitely disparate kinds of phenomena, whether physical, emotional, cultural, and so forth, and the myriad of truths, biological, chemical, ethical, the one with the philosophical habit of mind is able to integrate them into one whole. He or she is able to see how one thing impacts another thing, how one informs another, how apparently disparate things are able to coexist and cohere in a unified whole. But when the political economist moves beyond, and anal now we go back to the political economist, but when the political economist moves beyond an analysis of the market and the efficient allocation of goods and begins talking about the substance of the pursuit of happiness, the intellectual radar of the philosophically habituated will be activated. The same goes with the physician who might be competent to tell you what to do to be healthy, but does not have the right or the competency in Newman's view to say that bodily health is the sumum bonum or that the good life is beyond reach without such good health. The philosophically habituated can tell at what point Richard Dawkins's biology stops being biology and trespasses into the philosophical. But being able to do so depends on drawing students' attention to these key principles enumerated above. Now we turn to the indirect end or objective of Newman's university, the moral or religious end. And so I turn to his, his ideal, which is not only sagacity, but also sanctity. Newman's famous portrait of the gentleman has caused a little, not a little consternation among his readers. Newman's laudatio of the gentleman seems like a solid endorsement. And yet he is quite clear that the intellectual qualities of the refined gentleman can be used for ill. A philosophically habituated gentleman who does not take seriously his moral and religious duties can be dangerously crooked. And what is more, Newman is quite clear that intellectual training bears no relationship to moral improvement. For Newman, trying to tackle the giant moral deficits of human passion and pride with knowledge and reason is like querying granite with a razor or mooring a vessel with a silk thread. According to Newman, the, universal, the university's direct end is the cultivation of the intellect. Its indirect end, however, includes attention to the holistic formation, moral and spiritual, of the human person. The Catholic University has the indirect end of serving the church in this way. In a parallel fashion, we can say with Angela Bacone, who is in our presence, that although the intellectual pursuit suffices for the esse of the university, for its integrity, the perfection or bene esse, the moral spiritual pursuit is also necessary. The complementarity between the intellectual pursuit on the one hand and the religious, moral, spiritual formation on the other is embodied in Newman's ideal constellation of a university that lives within its constituent colleges or houses of residence. The university and its professors embody progress, dynamism, bustling creativity, and confront the world and all the challenges it poses. The college and its tutors, on the other hand, are dedicated to catechesis, discipline, the formation of good habits, moral character, and the fine tuning of intellectual habits. Newman has the students matriculated not only into a university, but into a routine that cultivates self-discipline and virtue, embodied in the college or the residence hall. There is a time for rising and a time for study. He provides for the students spiritual discipline and edification by offering daily morning mass and scheduling notable speakers to preach at the university church. He provides for wholesome recreation by purchasing for the students a billiard table as mentioned earlier, so that they can bypass the more questionable establishments for entertainment. <laughs> Academically, Newman's idea of the tutor is one who attends to both the intellectual and moral development of students. He's not simply an academic, but a resident assistant. 
Newman wants his students to excel not only in sagacity, but also sanctity. After the pattern of the medieval ideal of the university, it's to fit men for this world while it trained them for another. And such fitness and training obviously requires something more than intellectual prowess. He wants, as he phrased it in a different context, clear heads and holy hearts. In the Catholic University Church, Newman used the different liturgical feast days or gospel passages as occasions for reminding his students, nay, drilling into his students, that while it is indeed a privilege for the students to be studying and pursuing knowledge, this very knowledge will not get them any closer to holiness, and that ultimately, it is much more important to be a saint than a scholar. Saying as much risks giving an inaccurate, or at least an impoverished view of what exactly a Catholic university is for Newman. For it might be understood wrongly that all universities are essentially the same, that the academics are on par, but that the Catholic ones are better equipped for religious edification and the cultivation of moral virtue. Such a view, though not false, is impoverished. On the contrary, a Catholic university makes a difference, not only in the arena of the extracurriculars of moral and religion, but also precisely with that, within the academic sphere. And it is not because Catholic universities include theology and others do not, although this too is relevant. It is not even the e case, it is not even the ease with which the Catholic universities include theology, philosophy, and the liberal arts. The question then arises, what difference does a Catholic university make? So now I'm on my conclusion, sorry. The difference a Catholic university makes is that it helps, it has the capacity to help students ascend to key principles, such as being of the being of God and his attributes, without which a philosophical habit is impossible. Their ascent further would not only be notional, but also real. What is distinctive about a Catholic university, according to Newman, is not the spiritual and moral resources that keep students out of trouble and are sprinkled on top an already complete intellectual formation as icing on top of an intellectual cake. Such a view compartmentalizes the perfection of the intellect from human flourishing. Rather, these spiritual and moral resources provided by a Catholic culture or ethos on campus, such as a regular available liturgy, spiritual direction, mentorship, opportunities for service, charity, living arrangements conducive to the development of virtue and fruitful recreational activities. All these things play an integral part in academic excellence and in avoiding the pitfalls of viewiness and monomania. Students benefiting from such a Catholic ethos can taste and see the goodness of the Lord, who is the ground of the university unity of knowledge, the creator and goal of all things and the ground of their intelligibility. At a Catholic university, the biology reader who hears a lecture on genetics can also sing the words of Psalm 139. In short, a Catholic ethos helps cultivate not only simply a notional, but a vital imaginative or real ascent to those first principles necessary for the cultivation of a philosophical habit of mind in a way that is not only notional, but also real. I'll stop there. Good, very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Wonderful. Thank you all so far. Thank you to our speakers. And uh, we can introduce our next speaker now. Yeah, we've given Dermot an introduction, so I would say, Dermot, if you can hear us, please take us away. Yes, I can hear you. Brilliant. That was uh, I, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. So I want to make sure you can see my PowerPoint. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. 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 perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brilliant. Well, first of all, I want to thank the three preceding, preceding speakers. And uh, inevitably, there will be some slight overlap in what I'm going to say. I want to focus on this idea that the overall aim of the university is intellectual cultivation or what Newman will call uh, philosophy. And um, I want to begin with a link to Edith Stein actually from uh, John Paul II's encyclical Fides et Ratio from 1998, where he recommends reading 
uh, the philosophers. He, he, he writes, we see the same fruitful relationship between philosophy and the word of God in the courageous research pursued by more recent thinkers, among whom I gladly mention in a Western context, figures such as John Henry Newman, he mentions them, others, and Edith Stein. In referring to these, I intend not to endorse every aspect of their thought, but simply to offer significant examples of a process of philosophical inquiry, which was enriched by engaging with the data of faith. One thing is certain, attention to the spiritual journey of these masters can only give greater momentum to both the search for truth and the effort to apply the results of that search to the service of humanity. And I, that's a very balanced um, uh, way of, uh, incorporating or approaching the work of Newman, um, not endorsing every aspect of the thought, but saying that there's a stimulus here uh, to allow us to reflect on the relationship between faith and reason. Um, <clears throat> I want to just point at the right at the beginning to Newman's hesitations about coming to Ireland as a foreigner and as a convert um, uh, um, sticking his head into the lion's den of the Irish hierarchy in order to found his university. And he expresses these worries when he says, what do I know of the state of things in Ireland uh, that I should, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, that I should presume to put ideas of mine uh, uh, by the side of theirs who speak in the country of their birth and home. Why then should I be so rash and perverse as to involve myself in trouble not properly mine? Why go out of my own place? Why so headstrong and reckless as to lay up for myself miscarriage and disappointment as though I were not sure to have enough of personal trial anyhow without going about to seek for it? And I think that was in some respects prophetic, but it was also, uh, there's a great way in which Newman had uh, insight to recognize uh, the temerity that he was uh, having to have to enter into this world of founding a university in post-famine Ireland uh, with a great deal of opposition uh, from a number of the local uh, bishops and uh, uh, powers that be. Uh, nevertheless, he took his inspiration, as he says, from an older Ireland, from the Ireland that he took to be the, uh, uh, the uh, island of saints and scholars, um, and of course, here he writes in a language that I've no doubt uh, Fanola Kennedy will tell us the UCD history department would challenge. Uh, certainly many people wouldn't like to see this language uh, of saints and scholars, but he said, I cannot forget that at a time when Celt and Saxon were alike savages. Um, uh, he, I'll skip on down. I cannot forget how it was from Rome that the glorious St. Patrick went to Ireland and did a work so great that he could not have succeeded in it. The sanctity and learning and zeal and charity which followed on his death being the result of the one impulse which he gave. I cannot forget how in no long time under the fostering breath of the vicar of Christ, how a country of heathen superstitions became the very wonder and asylum of all people the wonder by reason of knowledge, sacred and profane, and the asylum of religion, literature, and science when chased away from the continent by the barbarian invasions, invaders. So here you have actually a very interesting um, uh, set of comments uh, relating to Ireland understood as an asylum for knowledge. Um, I like that terminology. And um, he also, Newman is often, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> seen as a sort of conservative, but in not many ways he was a modernist, and he tries to balance both the admiration of the past and past and a sense of the future. So he, uh, in his next, um, uh, uh, in the next slide that I want to give you, here he acknowledges that we there is no point in trying to return to the past. The past never returns, he says. The course of events old in its texture is ever new in its coloring and fashion. England and Ireland are not what they once were, but Rome is where it was and St. Peter is the same. So he of old made the two islands one by giving them joint work of teaching. And now surely he is giving us a like mission and we shall, over, and we shall become one again while we zealously and lovingly fulfill it. 
again, there's a sort of delicate balance there. Uh, we heard from Fanola Kennedy that uh, um, Newman had uh, certainly an awareness of, of uh, the uh, growing Irish nationalism. And uh, you can see at the same time, he's trying to balance between a sense of the past of Ireland and its future. He also is trying to propose uh, a new idea of a gentleman. And here in the university as aiming to produce gentlemen, we've already heard something about this, uh, but he is aware that in so doing, he's open to the objection that he's trying to bring in actually a very feudal idea. For instance, he says, some persons may be tempted to complain that I have servilely followed the English idea of a university to the disparagement of that knowledge which I profess to be so strenuously upholding. And they may anticipate that an academical system formed upon my model will result in nothing better or higher than in the production of that antiquated variety of human nature and remnant of feudalism called a gentleman. But in fact, uh, uh, Newman thinks that, no, he's not uh, um, reinvigorating an old feudal idea of the gentleman, of the knight or whatever. Rather, he says that when the Pope uh, suggested to the Irish hierarchy to start a university, he was aiming at some benefit uh, by means of literature and science to his own children, not indeed their formation on any narrow or fantastical type, as for instance, that of an English gentleman may be called, but their exercise and growth in certain habits, moral or intellectual. And I think that's the key, and I'll return to this, that the aim of a university is the inculcation of certain habits. <clears throat> now he goes, uh, the rest of my talk will focus on discourse seven, uh, where he laments that there's no English, no single English word uh, akin to health for the idea of intellectual proficiency. Uh, it will, it were well, he said, if the English, like the Greek language, possess some definite word to express simply and generally intellectual proficiency or perfection, such as health, as used with reference to the animal frame, and virtue with reference to our moral nature. I'm not able to find such a term. The consequence is that on an occasion like this, many words are necessary in order first to bring out and to convey what surely is no difficult idea in itself, that of the cultivation of the intellect as an end. Now he'll go on to say that the term he's going to use for this cultivation of the intellect is philosophy. In default of a recognized term, I've called the perfection or virtue of the intellect by the name of philosophy, philosophical knowledge, enlargement of mind or illumination. I believe as a matter of history, the business of a university is to make this intellectual culture its direct scope or to employ itself in the education of the intellect just as the work of a hospital lies in healing the sick or wounded. And, he, and so it's an interesting, given that Newman uh, was later on involved in uh, um, St. Cecilius to a certain level, uh, he writes that a hospital heals a broken limb or cures a fever. What does an institution affect which professes the health, not of the body, not of the soul, but of the intellect? So he, he, he uses in his, uh, in his discourse a parallel between a hospital uh, for healing the sick and the university for healing or promoting uh, the welfare of the mind, of the intellect. And then he goes on to talk about the aim of the university as enlargement of the mind. Um, and uh, as we heard already, that the only true enlargement of the mind for him is a holistic one is the power of viewing many things at once as one whole, of referring them severally to their true place in the universal system, of understanding their respective values and determining their mutual dependence. Uh, Fanola Kennedy said something similar earlier on. Um, and in this regard, uh, Newman, as we know, uh, wasn't in favor of a university as a place simply for the imparting of knowledge or what he calls material knowledge. Um, he, he thinks that, uh, if you like, material knowledge is not sufficient, although it's a prerequisite, I'll move on. Enlargement of mind is not for him just expansion. 
he writes, the enlargement consists not merely in the passive reception into the mind of a number of ideas hitherto unknown to it, but in the mind's energetic and simultaneous action upon and towards and among these new ideas which are rushing in on it. There is no enlargement unless there be a comparison of ideas one with another as they come before the mind and a systematizing of them. So it, for him, he says, it's knowledge not just of things, but of their mutual relations. And so it is not merely knowledge that is acquired, but as philosophy. And what he makes a lovely um, comment here, which I think is worth thinking about a little bit. Um, that be, merely being people who are well informed uh, is not what the university is about. And he gives the example of, as he says, seafaring men, for example, range from one end of the earth to the other, but the multiplicity of external objects which they have encountered forms no symmetrical and consistent picture upon their imagination. They see the tapestry of human life, as it were, on the wrong side, and it tells no story. Whereas he thinks, that they should that they are mere spectators of knowledge. He says they sleep, they rise up, they find themselves now in Europe, now in Asia, now seeing visions of great cities and wild regions. They are at the marts of commerce or among the islands of the south, and so on. Everything stands by itself and comes and goes in its turn like the shift, shifting scenes of a show which leave the spectator where he was. And there's a sense, actually, I can understand this very well, uh, that a lot of our, uh, I mean, Newman is aiming at the idea of the grand tour and the gentleman who went around visiting Pompeii and so on as part of a general education. And uh, he's not dismissing it, but he's thinking that this is very superficial. This uh, this great uh, tour, if you like, around the uh, various areas of knowledge is not sufficient. That what we need is something like uh, as he says, a kind of development of almost a stoic ideal of a certain uh, collected, patient and calm, recollective approach in knowledge. The intellect, which has been disciplined to the perfection of its powers, which knows and thinks while it knows, which has learned to leaven the dense mass of facts and events with the elastic force of reason, such an intellect cannot be partial, cannot be exclusive, cannot be impetuous, cannot be at a loss, cannot but be patient, collected, and majestically calm because it discerns the end of every beginning, the origin in every end, the law in every interruption, the limit in each delay, because it ever knows where it stands and how its path lies from one point to the other. Uh, <clears throat> it is the tetragonos of the peripatetic and the nil admirari of the Stoic. Um, and when I read these, and it is a challenge to read these long paragraphs, you realize or remember why Joyce praised Newman as the greatest prose writer in the English language. And I've been drawn to these very colorful, what you might say, purple patches in Newman's writing, because they're very, very evocative. Now, um, uh, Chairperson, I'm, I didn't know what time I begin. How, much, how many more minutes do I have? Three. <laughs> As long as you didn't say minus three. <laughs> That's okay. two bonus points added on. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we've already heard this. So I don't think I need to go into it uh, more, uh, what the uh, idea of the gentleman, the true idea of the gentleman, which applies also, of course, because um, it was taken up by Stein to the education of women, um, uh, what it involved for Newman. And he writes, the man who has learned to think and to reason and to compare and to discriminate and to analyze, who has refined his test, taste and formed his judgment and sharpened his mental vision, will not at once be a lawyer or a man of business or a soldier or an engineer, but he will be placed in that state of intellect in which he can take up any of these sciences or callings with an ease, a grace, a versatility and a success to which another is a stranger. And I think we've heard that several times uh, stressed in the course of the previous speeches by uh, the participants, uh, this idea that uh, the flexibility of mind, but also the intellectual, if you like, uh, um, calmness and uh, 
distance from passions that allows the educated person to participate uh, in discourse and in discussion uh, without becoming, if you like, uh, fanatical. Now, I'll just finish with this um, uh, to say something about the modern um, uh, value of a university drawing on um, Newman's ideas. Uh, first of all, universities as institutions, this is pointed out by Ap Anthony Appiah in an address not too long ago, uh, they are older or they're, they're than most states. Uh, the University of Paris is older than the French uh, state, as it were, and this is true of many, many universities. Secondly, and this of course is arguable, but they are unique, the European uh, um, accomplishment in insofar as they emerged, uh, sometimes supported by kings, sometimes by the church, but largely as self-regulating systems uh, where academics came together to vote on various matters or make agreement about uh, what the course of study should be. And they were and continue to be places of socialization. And um, surely this has become clearer to us since the pandemic, uh, when we have seen what happened when uh, young people were not allowed to congregate uh, in the open uh, halls of learning uh, in universities and the great social and psychological damage that was inflicted on them by that two years of absence. Uh, and finally, there are two uh, points that uh, uh, Newman emphasizes very strongly that I think are still uh, current, uh, namely the idea that a university is involved in the inculcation of civility and the cultivation of philosophical habit. And I'll end with his quotation on the nature of habit. Uh, in his Discourse 5, Newman writes that a habit of mind is formed which lasts through life, of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation, and wisdom, or what in a former discourse I have ventured to call a philosophical habit. And I think the, you know, the point is uh, clear. Philosophy for him is... Um, a whole mode of intellect, a mode of mind, but he was also fully aware that our highest degree in the university is still to this day called the doctor of philosophy. So universities are about philosophy in this broad sense. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dermot. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'll invite Paul Shrimpton to speak. Um, Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, let's see if we can attract his attention. Paul, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I'm just releasing myself, I think. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. You, right, you okay. Um, I think you have to let me be seen. Oh, I have to make you a co-host. I'm doing that now. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah. You, are, you need to be uh, upgraded. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, it should happen now. Any luck? Hmm. Um, there we oh, go. Great. One more. Is he coming? Thank you very much. So I'll set you up here on this end. So you're going to reappear on our screens. I have a box blocking your face. Excuse me. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, three years running, I think it is. Um, and well done for pulling off this uh, conference. So, um, yes, I'm speaking as a an historian of education, and the title I'm taking is Newman's Idea of a Tutor, and its Implementation at the Catholic University. 
Um, as mentioned by our first speaker, Fanola, um, John Henry Newman was invited to become the founding rector of the Catholic University in July 1851. Soon after accepting, he announced his intention to combine the professorial and tutorial system in his plans, adding that the principal making of men must be by the tutorial system. A year later, he explained that at Oxford, the real working men were not the professors, but the tutors, and he wished this to be the case in Dublin as well. My aim is to explore the richness of Newman's idea of a tutor, even though it might seem something like a lost cause to re revisit and possibly revise the tutorial system because of its expense. Nevertheless, I wonder whether the COVID pandemic has given us an opportunity to pause and rethink. Certainly, it has made us reconsider priorities and heightened our awareness of the importance of the personal dimension in education. Is it not an ideal time to reflect on the role of the tutor as envisaged by Newman? It seems inevitable that the new normal will see increased reliance on online lectures, and as a result, that higher education will be impoverished by seeing the human element diminished. But I wonder, it also offers an opportunity for the academy to rethink its mission and possibly to, re to compensate by introducing counterbalances into the system. For example, if lecturers were to spend more time in small group or even tutorial work once released from some of their duties in the lecture hall. So by revisiting some of Newman's arguments about this type of teaching, possibly he can open our minds to its benefits and instruct us on its workings. Now I should mention here um, at the outset that for Newman, education is an intrinsically relational activity. So in all his writings, phrases like mind to mind, person to person crop up repeatedly, in fact, anticipating um, his choice of motto, core at core loquitur. Right, I start in Oxford. After graduating at Trinity College, Newman became a college tutor at Oriel six years later. In those six years, he undertook private tutoring and therefore gained great experience. Um, the Oriel tutorship, however, despite its name, did not mean he was really a private tutor, but actually a college lecturer, um, teaching groups of between 12 and 15 people at a time, normally for two or three hours a day. It was an unwieldy system as the tutor was expected to tackle too many subjects and the pace was reduced by the presence of many backward or idle students. Um, in consequence, a private semi-official system emerged at Oxford in which private coaches were either engaged by serious students hoping to get a, a, uh, a class, an honours degree, or by idle students in an attempt to salvage a degree. Not long in the Oriel job, Newman decided to offer the more disciplined and promising students not just his sympathy in helping college work, but he laid it down as his rule that he would give without charge whatever additional instruction was necessary for those of his pupils who wished to read for an honours degree. Declaring that the system of private tutors brought unnecessary expense, he undertook to combine in his own person the two offices of public and private tutor. Now, within a couple of years, Newman was joined by two like-minded tutors, Harold Frude and Robert Wilberforce, who shared his idea that secular education could, if conducted properly, become a pastoral cure. The three, the, these two younger tutors were in perfect harmony with Newman's interpretation of the Lordian statutes of the 17th century, which stressed the pastoral role of tutors and maintained, as Newman put it, that a tutor was not a mere academic policeman or constable, but a moral and religious guardian of the youths committed to him. They too offered their more deserving pupils as much time and attention as the best tutors. And in what is this, volume six of the history of Oxford, Professor Prop says what these three did at Oriel provided the germ of the modern tutorial system at Oxford. But that was not all. Newman continued the work of his predecessor, John Keeble, 
another originator, if you like, of the Tractarian or Oxford movement. In breaking down the um, dis distant relations between teacher and taught, like Keeble, Newman read with his pupils, went out for walks with them, breakfast and dined with them, and in Newman words, cultivated relations not only of intimacy but of friendship, almost equality, putting off as much as might be the martinet manner then in fashion with college tutors and seeking them out in outdoor exercise, in evenings and in vacation. In many ways, this was this is Sheldon Rothblatt, um, American historian of education, says this was really um, ties in with the beginnings of character formation, uh, which started in England in the 1820s in the reformed public schools and then worked its way through Keeble and Newman into Oxford and then into Cambridge. Now in Newman, the undergraduates found a teacher who took the trouble to master his subject matter by enter in, entering into it, not just with his mind, but it, with his whole personality, giving life to the matter under consideration rather than merely conveying it by rote and rule. However dull the material they had to study, such as the logic they had to cover, Newman had the knack of breathing life into it. From the testimony of his pupils, we know that he challenged each of them to think for himself, to understand what he was reading, to articulate his ideas, to compare and contrast, to reduce an argument to its simplest form, to test it against historical examples, to recast it in his own words, in a different style, and to make comparisons with the present day. Now, to monitor pupils, Newman kept a detailed record of the reading he set his pupils, the plan of study he devised for each of them, how they coped with that plan and with the warnings they received from the head of the college, the Provost of Oriel, and how they performed in exams. These notes tell us that Newman took stock of each student and adjusted his demands accordingly, in other words, individually to every single one of them. Those who were academically able or well-grounded were not allowed to coast unchallenged or to idle their time away, while the weaker ones were coaxed along and offered support. Where the chemistry of affinity and friendship led to a greater bonding, Newman would exert himself further. However, not all students felt comfortable with this close attention offered to them, and he sometimes had to step back. Newman could at times be sternly demanding of his pupils, especially if he saw they were wasting their talents and could take a strong reprimand. On one occasion, he reproached Henry Wilberforce, the younger brother of his fellow tutor Robert, um, for wasting two terms. And I quote here, beware of repenting indeed of idleness in the evening, but waking next morning thoughtless and careless about it. I think it's probably true to say that Newman would have been embarrassed by the severity of that remark years later, but he did regard the university as a place of transition from boyhood to manhood, and therefore um, as a place which entailed re growing responsibilities for the uh, maturing individual. So one at the same time, he was both kind and understanding to his charges while remaining firm and demanding. Um, this degree of formative attention was just completely unknown um, at the time, other than through Keeble, Wilberforce and Trude. Um, given the centrality of the tutorial system in Newman's educational thinking, it comes as no surprise that he was determined to incorporate it into the structure he devised in Dublin. The obstacles were considerable, but that did not deter him. The fact that there was no university tradition among the Irish Catholics, there was of course among the Protestants with TCD, um, there was also the fact that he had to import it effectively into Ireland because the people who could make this system work were, who knew it, um, were the educated converts from Oxford and Cambridge. The difficulty there, of course, was this would displease the nationalist element among the Irish Episcopates who had collected the funds the university invited Newman to establish it. And then, of course, there was just the sheer lack of money. Um, the fact that it, the university is being founded just a few years after the Great Famine. Despite all these obstacles, however, Newman thought it was so important that he ought to incorporate it. So um, he blends these two systems together, the system of lecturing or professors 
um, and the tutorial system. Um, initially, he he um, requires of the people he appoints to do both to both lecture and to tutor. Um, now, in, in explaining this to the Irish bishops, what the role of the tutor was, Newman points out the shortcomings. This is unusual, I think, today of the lecture system. He says, and I quote, the work of the professor is not sufficient by itself to form the pupil. The catechetical form of instruction and the closeness of work in a small class, class as opposed to individual tutorial, are needed besides, end quote. Even if the professor was a man of genius, what was gained from the lectures would often be very superficial. Undoubtedly, the students were academically self-motivated, motivated would be able to profit from them but in general if the reliance was solely on lectures quote the result will be undisciplined and unexercised minds with few notions on which they're able to show off but without any judgment in any solid powers end quote arguing this fashion Newman arrives at his working rule that the principal making of men must be by the tutorial system in this way, the professor, while acting as tutor, quote, long quote here, on a smaller number at a time and by the catechetical method, will be able to exert those personal influences which are the, of the highest importance in the formation and tone of character among the set of students, as well as to provide the students, sorry, as well as to provide that the student shall actually prepare the subject for himself and not be a mere listener at a lecture. So as a Doriel, the tutors were to select the lectures for their students, to pair them by ensuring they had an elementary knowledge of the subject concerned, to question about the content afterwards, and to help them prepare for exams. Ideally, in Newman's conception, the tutors would be young men who had just taken their degrees, though Newman realized at first he had to rely on older men imported from Oxford. Now, in the first annual report about the university, which he wrote for the Irish bishops, Newman explains the tutors will be half companions, half advisors to their pupils, that is, of the students. And while their formal office will be that of preparing them for lectures and the exams, they will be thrown together with them in their amusements and recreations and gaining their confidence from their almost parity of age, and their having been so lately what the others are still, they may be expected to exercise a salutary influence over them, and will often know them more about them than anyone else. In the build-up to the opening of the Catholic University in the autumn of 53, that is, until November 54, we know from Newman's correspondence that he he, he lavished great care on his choice of tutors. And in one of the preliminary um, essays in the University Gazette, he emphasizes the tutorial supervision, which actually complements the education imparted at lectures. In other words, it was an ideal vehicle for the student's intellectual discipline. And another longish quote here, the student's diligence will be steadily stimulated. He will be kept up to his aim. His progress will be ascertained and his week's work like a labourer's measured. It is not easy for a young man to determine for himself whether he has mastered what he has been taught. A careful catechetical training and a jealous scrutiny into his power of expressing himself and of turning his knowledge to account will be necessary if he is to really profit from the able professors whom he is attending, and all this he will gain from the college tutor. After the university had been running for two years, Newman composed a digest of this system for what he called the um, scheme of rules and regulations, explaining how it fitted into his system of small collegiate houses of up to 20 students each. Now, dwelling on the heart of the, tu the tutor's task, he explains that the tutor um, would adjust himself to the needs of each student and cater not just for those who are able and studious, but also for those who showed little love of learning and had not developed study habit, habits or backward. The tutor would oversee the reading of the more promising ones by starting them off with advice. 
explaining diff difficult passages of text, testing them now again, bringing to their attention points they might have overlooked, helping them with summaries and generally keeping an eye on them. Different tactics were required for the backward who would need support to remedy their shortcomings and make the most of lectures. But for the idle, too, who would need to be kept on their toes and confronted with their lack of diligence in the run-up to exams. All this, Newman says, would demand of a tutor a sustained solicitude and a mind devoted to his charge. Newman enlarges on the possibility of the tutor's role by suggesting that the way to a young man's heart lay through his studies, particularly in the case of the more able. Feeling grateful for the person who takes an interest in the things which are at that moment nearest to his heart, the student opens up to his tutor and from the books between them, two of them, they're led into conversation, speculation, discussion. There is intercourse of mind with mind. There's that thing again, mind with mind, with an intimacy and sincerity which can only be when non-others are present. Obscurities of thought, difficulties of philosophy, perplexities of faith are confidently brought out, confidentially brought out, sifted and solved, and a pagan poet or theorist may thus become the occasion of Christian advancement. And in this way, the tutor forms the, tutor's, the pupil's opinions and becomes the friend, perhaps the guide of his life after university. Now, we know from one of his, so Newman actually um, headed up one of the four collegiate houses called St Mary's in Harcourt Street. He didn't just do that, but he operated as one of the three tutors at the house. He didn't do a lot of tutoring, but after he died, one of his students wrote in the press, I learned more as to the writing of Latin from a few classes with Newman given privately to, to the men of his own house. Uh, by him as its tutor than I did from a longer course of lectures under the two professors of Latin and Greek. And I quote here, to read the Greek tragedians in the same manner with Newman was indeed a classical treat I love to recall. Now I'm finishing here. Um, so what can we learn from Newman and his idea of the tutor? Surely it is that personal influence is what gives any system its dynamism, the action of mind on mind, personality on personality. This is lacking in systems based solely on the lecture and even more so when they're reliant on distance learning. Newman's insistence on the pastoral dimension of the academy is a lesson for us today. His daring designs for Oxford eventually um, came to fruition there in the 1870s and 80s. Looking back um, from the vantage point of the 21st century, it, seemed, it seems to us overly ambitious to have attempted to introduce a modified version of the tutorial system in, into Ireland in the 1850s when resources were pitiful and the demand non-existent. Yet it should be noted that Newman's aim was not to replicate Oxbridge arrangements at the time, um, was to replicate Oxbridge arrangements at a time when the tutors were generally young academics who had not long graduated. Froude, Wilberforce and Newman were 25, 26 and 27 year olds um, when they were doing that tutoring. Um, I might just draw this to a close and not finish what I was going to say, but um, okay, um, two other things maybe. Um, in somewhere or other, um, where's my footnote? Um, in, in Latin writing, an essay he wrote for the Gazette, he talks about balancing um, the, the, as Newman does, as this prophet of equilibrium, as Cardinal Marcolet once called him, um, the business about learning from books and learning from teachers. And Newman, in a wonderful passage, explains that we've, we should be trying to do both. Um, he also balances this idea of um, saying the public or display lecture is one thing, um, but actually the graft of a normal lecture at university is quite another. Um, right, I've, and the final thing I'll say is, which you may not know about, which I 
because I, I suppose being a product of Oxford and the tutorial system, one of the things built in, which knew, was there in the um, 1810s and 1820s, which Newman exported to Ireland, wasn't just this thing of um, oral and written exams, but was the um, termly collection. So when there weren't public exams, at the end of every term, the student was called in to face the head of the college, uh, flanked by a lecturer or two, or certainly the tutors, and reports were read out, and then the student had a, a minute or two to, to defend himself, usually, <laughs> against the accusations. And the conversation normally went on for three or four minutes, not starting with academic things, but going on to the extracurricular things. And I'll find, finish here with that great, very, that much quoted um, idea of a university where Newman calls it a, uh, an alma mater, knowing her children one by one, not a foundry or a mint or a treadmill. Right, I'll finish there. Thank you very much, uh, Paul Shrimpton. Uh, wonderful paper, thank you. Um, so, will Colin, do you want to? Yeah, no, I, what time do we need to be on before they? Uh, I think the half past eight is the. Uh, we'll be locked yeah. in after half past eight. Brilliant. So, yes. we have lots and lots of time. Thank you, five um, tremendous speakers. Uh, and I think as, as, as Dan does his magic behind me, hopefully putting both uh, Dermot Moran and uh, Paul Shrimpton back up on the screen to, to field questions, I might ask if anyone has one to start with the guests who are here with us in the room, uh, if anyone has a launch point they'd like to take. And oh, <laughs> and indeed we can we can we can start I have with her. Question for you. Oh dear. <laughs> I think you have the knowledge that I was sort of wondering as I read through the idea of university. A lot of it looks to a non-Irish person as I am, as if it would have been really hard to swallow for the public, because he comes with a tradition that is so different from, um, from what I presume must have been there. Um, and in particular, um, what, what was the relate, what, how did he look on Manumus? I think what I might do is that it, it's, it would be rude of me to jump on the, the panel naturally, but I know that Paul Shrimpton, who will join us back in a moment, has written on this more recently than I have. Now, Paul, you and I might not always agree on every particular, but I would, I would, I would be reluctant to take that one and be greedy myself. And I would rather, if you, if you heard the question, Paul, did you? So hang on, well, two seconds. We, we, we don't have you yet. Don't, don't jump in just yet. I think you might be muted. Oh, yes, the owl is now talking to you. Yes. Okay. Can I show that to you? Would that be okay? I, I would love to answer that. I think you might be able to answer it better than me, though. So I'm going to throw it to you. Um, Newman was um, extremely unhappy with the chaotic system in Oxford. So he was um, reforming it um, from within. He introduced written exams into Oriel College and university followed suit um, two years later um, in, in, in 1830. Um, so he was pushing reforms from within. Um, the, Oxford essentially was 25 mini universities operating completely separately. Um, well, can I just jump, jump in very briefly? I think Meadow was also keen on interesting and Newman's response to Maynooth. Yeah, okay. um, how, how, that, how that was received uh, when he gave the discourses and articulated what you so, so interestingly mm. gave us about the trail system. How did that land in an Irish context? And how did Newman look at the, the most prominent exemplar of Irish ed, higher education, which would be Maynooth at that time, if you could? Um, he visited Maynooth, as far as I know, it's seven or eight times. He was friendly with various people there, but he doesn't really talk ever about the teaching system. And I can say that almost definitely because um, I've just finished editing the two sort of volumes, My Campaign in Ireland, parts one and part two, and there's nothing there at all um, about the teaching system at Maynooth. So what I suspect is in dealing with, um, there were three O'Reilly's, <laughs> the one there who might, I think was teaching at 
at Maynooth, um, I, I, the conversations were able to pick things up uh, from just dealing with them. <clears throat> just one very small point about Maynooth. He was extremely um, impressed and happy with um, Russell of Maynooth. Mm -hmm. And he felt that he learned from him and they had a very amiable relationship. So I think that might be worth mentioning. And Maynooth was obviously a seminary, which was not what he regarded as a university, as what he was constructing. But he did have this friendship and he, he, he wrote to Russell and um, seemed to have a very favorable relationship with him. Um, can I ask anyone to jump in with another question for any of our speakers? <coughs> Patrick Baum, I see you there. Um, perhaps uh, well, a general question for all the speakers, which is there once was an Austrian general called Conrad von Hotzendorf, who was regarded as a great strategist because he drew up very elaborate and well thought out battle plans, but he usually lost the actual battles because he, did, because he didn't take account of the resources which were actually available to him. How far is that? Could this criticism be made of Newman that he was making the same mistake as General Conrad von Hotzendorf? That he was, was drawing, that he was drawing up plans for an ideal university without uh, really considering what 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 was what, actually what was actually available to him. Would anyone like to take that question? Dermot, you're, you're muted. Uh, yeah, I, there's a certain degree of truth in that. I mean, Newman struggled to find students for his new university and had a number of people going around Europe looking for, you know, wealthy sons uh, to pay the fees. Uh, so there was a there was a dearth of fee paying uh, middle class who were willing to um, enter into a brand new university about which nothing was known to understand. Uh, the difficulty in, in attracting people in. So perhaps he could have thought through that a bit more, but then there was, he was in battles with the uh, hierarchy for funding as well. Uh, so um, I, others know much more about his, his engagements there and perhaps can comment on it. Maybe I'll just say, well, it was actually part of my question in relation to what, what I experienced as insensitivity. I thought he was in the idea of the university really insensitive mm -hmm. to the content. Now I only know it for 25 years, but and of course he would have known it still less. But after two years here, I would have been able to spot that he was insensitive. To Maynooth or to, to Ireland? To the whole mm -hmm. setup in which Maynooth, of course, played an important role mm -hmm. as soon as you said carefully. Mm -hmm. So I think. But, but so in a, in a certain sense, I want the Irish context to have some of the merit of having made it a success, because after all, Newman's foundation of Catholic University became the beginning of the Catholic, of, of the, university, the, Catholic, the Catholic university tradition here, that is, the university tradition for Catholics. So it, that was not only Newman's achievement, but it was also his through a kind of strange provocation, which then was taken up very good heartedly, I think, by everybody concerned, including Paul Collins. <laughs> yes, ma'am. One curious concession to the Irish was perhaps the fact that he hired from the very beginning a man to lecture in French and German, and another to lecture in Spanish and Italian. And um, this is, is intriguing me at the moment. It's an obsession of mine at the moment. And I'm wondering why that is so, apart from the mere fact that the Queen's Colleges all had professors of modern languages, which had been the Antipolitan, and of course, we know about Trinity since 1776. It had had a, a chair of modern languages. I don't know if any of the panelists can enlighten me on this question. Have you come across? Anything he said about the modern languages, there's there's nothing if you Google in the yeah, university. I, I that a little bit. Paul, am I right in remembering that the modern languages positions were on on Newman's lists very early on? 
that that was something that, that stayed pretty consistent as he as he tipped and trimmed the various things he wanted to appoint. Is that my memory right? Yes. I mean, I think he appointed somebody, an Italian by the name of Marani, who had uh, previously taught at um, Trinity. And there was also a French priest by the name of um, Schur. Yeah. Hmm. And Renouf, I think, offered some French classes as well, possibly informally, if memory they serves. Were, were lots of French people. Yeah, I mean, Peter, uh, Peter Page, the Renouf, uh, University of College Dublin Press did a wonderful four volume edition of Renouf's letters, in fact. Yes, Renouf, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. From Jer Jersey? Was it Jersey? I think so. Anyway, one of the Channel Islands. Yeah. yeah. Guernsey. Yeah. Because, sorry, just no, please. The model for Catholics for higher education in Ireland before the arrival of the Queen's was of course the continental colleges. Yeah. So I think there's a language connection there somewhere. Great. Certainly my own suspicion on that is that Newman by that point, and I think Paul can, can check me on this or not, but I, I suspect you might agree, is that Newman by this point assumed that this was part of what an Irish middle-class education was expected, right. probably looking at the Queen's colleges and seeing exactly that. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the French colleges are like Yeah, college. absolutely. And indeed, the French professor at Cork, if my memory is right, had yeah. gotten himself in significant bother at just that point yeah. so with the hierarchy. Barakur, I believe his name was. Yeah, exactly. Sir. Um, just, just a different question. Um, and when Carver's kind of gave away, so I'm interested in faith and the uh, whole business of sanctity, of course, that uh, um, Andrew Mazaris brought up there, I thought was interesting. Just to connect it with a recent event, um, a friend of mine was visiting, a friend of mine, well, I got to know him, but we're of like mind, put it this way. He was Japanese and uh, he went into UC campus and happened to go into the church um, there uh, during a mass, which had been offered for some students who had died the previous year. And he was very impressed with, number one, that there was a, a Catholic church in a, a non-secular uh, university. That struck him as being amazing. It was, that was just the mind followed there. And then he was just very happy because he happened to be a Catholic himself. He, he converted to Catholicism himself years ago just to see so many young people uh, attending a religious ceremony. And uh, what well, that seemed to me, the, the beautiful report, I don't get many reports like that <laughs> from that, from UCD or any other campus for that matter. I happen to serve in a church not too far away from UCD, and I feel this, this gulf between what the church does in terms of this liturgical celebration and the world that young people live in, that there's so much anxiety out there, and there's so much um, support, aid, potentially, in a liturgical context, and yet there seems to be no connection between the two. Uh, I don't know if that's... <laughs> Relevant to maybe Andrew, if I could, I could maybe take that further and, and, and throw a question to you in, in that context is, is thinking about Newman as a theologian, and there's lots of work done doing this or that aspect of Newman's theology. One thing maybe you could comment on is Newman in the sense of putting this into practice in the context of Dublin in the context of the university houses and how that, that sense of spirituality, the emphasis on the spiritual dimension plays as you see that in, in, in Newman's career as whether this Dublin phase of it, which is so often perceived as a, as a failure, as Newman himself understood it as a failure, or as seen as a sort of blip as he returns to Oxford, how does, how does this fit to you in the Newman, Newman story? Yeah, in terms of like the, the way he kind of viewed his whole career. His whole yeah, career. or just or when, he, when he's dealing with, again, back dealing with, with young men in a collegiate environment, university environment, and, and that, that sense of that, that importance of, of the spiritual. Yeah. You know, how do you see that developing in the Dublin context? Well, I think what's, what's significant, I think, is the fact that he was always, he's a, always around edu education. So, I mean, part of, a formative part of his life, I think, is uh, the oratory school. And so he goes back to Birmingham and he spends loads of time, um, not with university students, but with younger students preparing them. So it's always, it was his line, as he always says, education was always my line. Mm -hmm. uh, but like with respect to uh, this, it's not a tension, but there's these two aspects of coming to something. And he makes this distinction between the notional and the real. And, it, and you, can sense, you can sense it in the idea already but it, it crops up again in the grammar 
where he talks about uh, how you accept a religious proposition and do you do it as a notional thing, as a fact, as a theory, and he calls that theology, or you can do it in an imaginative way where the terms of these propositions refer to things that enlightens your imagination, that moves you, and he calls that devotion or religion, uh, uh, an imaginative, real ascent. And I think the, the whole point of the university for him is a place where you do both, ideally, ideally. And that's where the lack of, say, uh, a liturgical life or a Bible chaplaincy or something, or where a chaplaincy might be there, but it's um, isolated, uh, where it only does something liturgical and never anything intellectually formative, I think for Newman would be short-sighted. It's too compartmentalized, whereby a, chaplain, a chaplaincy, for example, only does provides the liturgical stuff. And then the intellectual stuff where we do that on the campus. I think for him, um, in his ideal model, there wouldn't be a need for a chaplaincy because he would just have a, a resident uh, Catholic ethos. But in the second best situation where you have a chaplaincy, for example, uh, they would be um, engaged in intellectual activity as well, precisely within this context of uh, devotion. And so you're oscillating constantly between uh, devotion uh, and intellectual exploration. Just to, to add on to that, I mean, again, my memory may be failing here, but I think I am right in saying, and again, anyone jump in and tell me I'm wrong, that when Newman was dividing, as you guys were talking about, I think Andrew, as you talking about, and others, the importance and differentiating between the collegiate and the university and the appropriate functions to each. And he located so much of the moral formation, the spiritual formation in the colleges. But if I'm right in remembering one, possibly one of two exceptions, and Paul catch me on this, was the university church itself and the sermons offered in the university church, which he was a place where that was very explicitly a university function that overlapped with the spiritual. And it was, it was a really quite a striking move because he, he compartmentalized almost all of the spiritual component in, in the collegiate houses. Is that ringing a bell, Paul? Yes. I mean, I would say he um, was keen on the religious training to operate at the colleges, but um, the teaching of religion um, in a less personal form um, to be the role of the university. But of course, the um, each of the collegiate houses had their own chapel too, of course, where the students would normally attend mass and they only came together on the Sunday. Yeah. This gentleman had a question here. Uh, I just want to talk to the fundamental principle here that uh, education is basically about the definition of a human being. Obviously, Newman had his idea, but I would say today this is a major problem. We do not agree on what is a human being. So how can we continue to have these institutions that well, we simply don't agree what a human being is? And we have also entered into the world of psychology <coughs> so that the human being today is defined philosophically, psychologically, so the notion of human is not something that's acceptable today by most people. Sorry to say. Anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah. Those things that bring characters and different people. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. There is not a common definition, and it's a very important subject. That because if you're a teacher and public students every day, you've got to have some notion. What are these? What is? What is a human being? Is it a rational animal with a soul? What is it? But we seem to just think, is it well, we all sort of agree on? We don't agree on that at all. That's the problem with Catholic education today. I, I worked in the States for many years. I've worked in young Catholic education. There's no definition. We don't agree on what human beings are. Well, sir, are you back then? Would anyone like to jump in on that? Would there have been an agreed definition that Newman could, could reach or that would be received beyond a Catholic and English and Irish Catholic audience that would have been, he could have taken for granted? Well, I think he would have seen that a human being is creative mm -hmm. and that he does not create himself. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between then and now. Mm -hmm. And your reference earlier on to the University being seen as, if you like, um, a hospital for the intellect. One asylum, I think, wasn't it? That was that was you, Dermot. Wasn't it asylum? Well, yeah. The hospital. He, 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 no. 
Okay. No, I'm sorry. The question I'd like to ask is, if that was the case, why do we have such a malaise in our society today in relation to identity? And have we not had, given uh, Newman's tradition in our Catholic inst institutions or universities, why have we not had the heavyweight battles that would have confronted, you know, the structuralists, the post-structuralists, and, and the modernists, you know, where have have you been? Have our philosophers been asleep at the wheel? That's my question. As a historian, I would obviously say yes, probably. I <laughs> but I think Dermot has to jump in here. <laughs> mm. uh, what, have been, what have you been doing, Dermot? Uh, well, first of all, I think Newman does use the word hospital as well as asyl asylum. A kind of, well, the, he, he's talking about that the university should be something an analogous to a hospital for the human cultivation. Uh, I think Newman would have agreed that there was no uh, shared definition of human being, even within his own time. I mean, there was debates about evolution that he was involved in later on and so on. But Newman's point was that the educated person has to be someone who can approach these difficult topics and bring to them a sort of calm resilience uh, in exploring how they should be treated. I mean, he you mentioned psychology. Of course, uh, 19th century was the, you know, the great um, foundational time for psychology as a discipline. Um, I don't think Newman put it in his list of uh, disciplines, but uh, he was, but Renouf was married to the, uh, to one of the Brentanos, and Franz Brentano is one of the founders of psychology, so certainly would have been aware of it. I mean, my own view is that Newman's style university uh, would have included, um, you know, psychology, anthropology, sociology, uh, political science, all of the disciplines with an awareness of their historical foundations in the traditions, especially of the West. And uh, I mean, Renouf was a, a Egyptologist, so I think he was quite open to all kinds of uh, intercourse with other traditions. Uh, but the whole idea, perhaps, of the university would be to uh, hammer out a definition of a human being rather than to start with one a priori. That would be part of what he would have criticized, I think, is having an inflexible approach by assuming that we all know what it is and then think we can just start from there. That would be so, you know, that would be my sort of response on that question. So then I would only add that part of the hammering out, I agree completely. And part of the hammering out of, of the question of what is a human being is precisely to involve all of the disciplines together mm -hmm. so that you're not reductive. So the biologist can't exhaust the definition as a human person is a bundle of cells or made up chemically or an advanced primate or whatever. So you have to have all the disciplines checking each other uh, to make sure that no one discipline has a monopoly on it. And that, that way you get a complete picture of various true angles on what the human person is. And of course, Newman also founded theology in the same way, yeah. that it, theology was not to take it, to overarch the others as well. That it, it was, it was yeah. in the list the of astronomy, yeah. 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 which was bold in its time, particularly to the Catholic audience. Right. Surely we can kick philosophy a bit more. Yes. So um, I was really struck listening to everyone between um, the, they're not opposite, but they can sound opposite, the kind of the notion of the lecture and sort of presenting knowledge almost from a top down basis, and then also the approach of the tutorial to taking the almost catechetical approach. And um, I wondered if anyone, forgive me for this, would like to comment on maybe sort of the Catholic tradition of catechetics and how that might be an accident point to the more top-down knowledge approach using that catechetical personal tutorial approach that um Paul was describing. Anyone want to take that? Or, or I could throw it to Paul since you did talk about the, the Newman's idea of the tutor at length. But does anyone want to jump in from a different perspective? I'm going to take that as a no. Paul, can you take that one? I'll mute it. You're muted. We can't hear you. Can't hear you, Paul. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Because I, I only caught a bit of it. 
Shall I try and I can try and restate, or you can come forward. I I may get it wrong, so start waving at me. What okay. what what um, was asked was in in the discussion of Newman is emphasis on the tutorial is distinct from the lecture, mm -hmm. and the question was what role or place does the Catholic catechetical tradition play in or could play in that in understanding the distinction between lectures and tutorials or the value of tutorials? And, and possibly that lovely quote about Newman and the Prophet in equilibrium, finding that balance between the lecture and the tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Finding that balance between a kind of abstract top-down knowledge right. and a practical experience. Finding, I think you hear that, Paul. Finding the equilibrium between top-down knowledge and, and more practical knowledge, the, the prophet of equilibrium was the quote. <laughs> uh, and 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 you could explore it within the context of the Catholic catechetical tradition. Perfect. Right. Um, we don't know quite what Newman had in mind, um, but I think he saw the role of the tutor because um, when he was a tutor at Oxford, um, the okay. So <laughs> perhaps people don't realise that um, as an Anglican clergyman he would have either um, ended up in a parish or as a, a missionary. But actually he saw um, his role as being um, a clergyman in education. So um, he, at Oriel, he saw this coming about and it wasn't just um, dealing with religion in the abstract, but with individuals, as I mentioned, um, going over, in Nick, the Nick, Nick McKeon ethics were the main book they used in fact, um, we don't know really what happened because there's no record of this, the, the, um, of how, how it all went, uh, but the three younger tutors at Oriel of the four all taught either individually or small groups. Um, so a lot of it's to do with um, questions and answers and also in the personal essays which Newman required people to write. This was absolutely novel at the time. Nobody wrote essays, but Newman again was new at that. So we do have a few of those essays. I've not studied them with his personal comments on them, but that would be another way of bringing out um, what the individual thought um, and then going through it with them in person. Um, and we know that's what he did at the Oratory School. Again, I've not looked at it. I know a priest from Spain is working on this at the moment, the, to the, the top two years at the Oratory School, when Newman gave his lectures, um, they took down notes and then Newman looked at them afterwards and annotated them. Um, but that's yet to be published, all that. I think somewhere Mark Patterson, so it's probably in his memoirs, uh, and Patterson had, put, had been a student at Oriel, uh, and he said, again, from memory, and this is many years later and from a critical perspective, but that Newman could never get, or the thing to understand about Newman is he's always a priest. That was central to everything he did in his tutorial and his teaching. Patterson in later life would have seen that as a barrier, I think, possibly to the tutorial relationship. But it, he certainly stressed the importance, which I think when I read the mem Patterson's memoirs, that at least struck me as convincing. But it's, stressing it's, that priesthood as a tutor. In fact, he says, if you don't mind me interrupting or adding, no, please. He says the, the idea of a Catholic university is a contradiction in terms. Yeah. So, yeah. Dan. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Nola. Um, um, you, you, you taught in UCD uh, yes, in yeah. the past. I wonder whether, and being uh, someone who knows Newman's work is very well as well, how, how did you, and maybe just relate, you were a lecture, you lectured in UCD. How did you find the, on the question of the lecture versus the tutorial, how did you find it? How did you find the, effectiveness of the lecture did you feel as if you were uh, ever coming mind to mind with the uh, uh, students in that role um, yes i i lectured and i gave tutorials and i received tutorials when i was a student and i think the tutorials were tremendously important i remember garrett Fitzgerald was my tutor at one stage and Garrett would take us to the country shop, which is now gone for coffee. And he would talk in such an open manner. Like I remember well him talking about how he was drawn to Sean Lamas and Fianna Fáil, you know, and he became a Fine Gael Bishop. And I said, Dr. Fitzgerald, 
what about your father? You know, because his father. <laughs> and I remember standing on the steps. He said, Phew. he said, my father has got nothing got to do with this whatsoever. <laughs> because he was doing CIO reports, the Commission on uh, the Commission on Industrial Organization. He was examining a range of industries for La Masse. And then when I um, became a lecturer and a tutor, I absolutely loved it. And I loved teaching. And in tutorials, I'm, I, I know you're a friend of John Fitzgerald, so I have to say, well, I'll just be truthful. John was in one of my tutorials and Ethna, his wife to be, and they claimed they met in that tutorial and they've never forgotten it, you know? And as I used to say to people at the start, listen, if you don't know more economics at the end of the year, than I know, I failed. Yeah. And they kind of look at me, but it was true because some of the people I had, like, good God, Peter Neary was in tutorials and he was the top Irish economist. And um, he's dead, sadly. You know, John and Eth, they were in tutorials. Um, um, a lot of people in those days who did law, did law and economics. So I had some very bright lawyers, you know? And they were just, um, they were just very kind. A woman in economics was a bit of a, a surprise. And um, like I tell my feminist uh, daughter, well, they're all feminists, but um, I never encountered any difficulty because there was a woman. There was a marriage bar in it, but they, they worked their way around it. But I don't know if that's an answer, but I actually loved the tutorials. And my kind of approach was a bit unusual. I would ask them to give a sort of a, a five minute opener rather than me coming along. I mean, maybe it was a cop out, but I remember one of my very first ones was in Newman House because we were still teaching in the terrace. <laughs> and John McGuire, who became a professor in Cork, a politics, but his sister had been in class with me. And I said, John, you know, could you do something on um, the rate of interest or something like that? And like he came off with loads of stuff that I was kind of catching up with, you know. But that was my kind of scheme that, that I get them to, I wouldn't go along in the tutorial. And I did get to know them. I mean, it was a great system. I just loved it, you know. Anyway, I'm sure that's a bit of a meander. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I just I want to say one thing. Having these students begin to teach the, the, the that's been rediscovered now. It's called flipping the classroom. So you were <laughs> you were flipping the classroom <laughs> long before the, uh, the well. I I don't know, but I used to kind of imitate what Garrett did, and yep. we sometimes go for coffee in the annex, and um, everything was smaller then. Now I know when we moved to Belfield. Um, you all had offices, like where sort of six of us would have shared a coat hanger in, in, in Terrace, you know, it was amazing. So I remember bringing in this blue kind of mat, thinking that was very nice. I remember Richard Wooten, whom I became very friendly with, was in one of the chores. Richard hardly said anything. He was very um, kind of, you'd feel he was thinking, maybe he was thinking, does your one know anything, you know? But I remember I had the blue, and I could list off a whole lot of them, and I absolutely loved it. I just felt it was a great time in my life, and I was just very, very lucky, you know? And it sounds like the social and the educational there coming yeah, together very much. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Yeah, and, and you want, you. yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say, I knew a whole lot about Newman at that stage, and I wouldn't have been, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have been up to speed in a lot of that, but I had a few principles of education, like which I carried on with my children, rightly or wrongly. Mm -hmm. And like one of them was from Patrick Pierce, you know, when, when this mother was bemoaning up in St. Andrews, oh, he do nothing, you know, Seamus is a writer. I said, he must, Pierce said, he must do something. And Pierce said, well, actually, she said, actually, he, he loves, he loves playing the tin whistle. And Pierce said, buy him a tin whistle. You know, and that's one of my things that if they were good at any part of the economics or had an interest. Um, and the other thing is, Mullah and Lanavok is Turkish, you know, 
if you encourage people. But I have a very good friend who was good enough to come tonight, Gay B, who was in my class in UCD. Gay, is that a lot of rosh now? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I live in a place I share it with businesses and coffee shops and garbage stores. But one thing I remember from this garbage store is this last year on about um, ministerial expenses. <laughs> Long before he became involved in politics. <laughs> <laughs> George was very encouraging for women, you know, and his early lectures, I can still remember him writing up on the board about the um, European, the EEC before we went into it. And he had other ones about like the price of tomatoes and centers for deficit and how this would all work out and how prices worked out in the European Union. Stuck in my head <laughs> like, for years. Anyway, thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. Please. What I would wonder is what do you think about? Departments of sports science and nursing and all the things that have been brought into university management. Really, I, I think they have lost their own themselves. Um, and a lot of the nursing profession would agree. Would anyone if present or the screen like to take on Newman and sports science? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I think you're muted. Yep, sorry. Do you mind? Could you very quickly repeat the question? Would you like me to restate that? Is for you? What no one okay. would think of all the stuff, the um, practices that there are now in the university, like sports science. Right. Right. Cat and cat Should they yeah. ever have become academic subjects? Did you hear the question? No, sorry, I didn't actually. Uh, so the question was around what Newman would feel about the, the multiplication of departments and subjects in universities. And the, the example given was sports science. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the disciplines that uh, or departments that have emerged in our modern university, what Newman's view might be in your view, in your judgment. Right. Um, I think, it, well, as it, it links in with all the different talks here, I think, but he wanted the whole circle of knowledge filled out. So he wanted, um, he, he would want a representative subject from that sort of domain. Certainly in terms of science, he was encouraged from Rome, in fact, to, to set up, this is more the physical, chemical, biological sciences, which he did as well as the medical school. Um, but given that he was even thinking of um, chemical making processes and agriculture, I think he might have bought into that, so to speak, yeah. Um, I think what he would, I, I, the example I sort of used in the past in talks is um, um, to do with um, movie studies and things like that. I think he felt that um, a, a new discipline isn't fit for university until various scholars have chewed over it for 10, 20, 30 years. And there's a base there which to get your teeth in, the subject has become structured, then it becomes um, raw matter from which you can develop your intellectual muscles and things. But um, it needs a while to bed down first before it enters into university. Uh, just when Newman was coming to Dublin first, he said that he looked forward to continuing his struggle in Dublin, but he had waged in Oxford against Richard Wakeley's latitudinarian and utilitarian view of education. I mean, given the state of the modern university, could it be argued that it's actually Wakeley's idea of the university has been more successful than Newman's? So what are the implications of that? Wakeley wins the your thesis. Who would like that? I think one? that's broadly correct. And your average university has been dubbed by some as a as U2 universities that are inclined on feeding men and, and making us uh, good workers, productive workers, efficient. Uh, and that's what happened. Now, that's not to say that the antidote to that or the solution to that is pure liberal arts. So uh, Newman's University was not just pure liberal arts. So, already mentioned all the other faculties, including very practical ones, engineering, and you might have actually said yes to something like sports science. But I think uh, where I think Paul has a point, um, anytime you, you see the word studies, uh, something studies, it betrays a certain immaturity or newness of a discipline that has yet to be worked out exactly, cultural studies. Um, Irish studies. Irish, <laughs> the object of the discipline is undefined. Uh, I 
I think not to say that in itself or per se you have to get rid of it or something or that it's excluded, it's excluded but I think that's that's something to raise the alarm bells and maybe it, it requires further patients who are waiting to see how that pans out. But I think the average the average university, to the extent, for example, that it doesn't accept the the, 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 the principles of the unity of knowledge, it excludes certain disciplines a priori. Uh, I think that that university would fail Newman's test at least of being uh, a place of uh, the pursuit of knowledge rather than the perfection of the intellect, uh, and it has become a yeah, a cog in the machine, if you will. Sir. Yeah. Surely um, universities, ever since they started, have had a hybrid function, pursuing knowledge for its own sake, certifying that the university does it. And then the other side, sports science, medical medicine, surgery, law, where you're essentially trying to, the student is trying not just to pass the university exam, but to be accepted within the profession. So that leads me to think, if I tell <coughs> you, the one sort of really viable faculty in Newman's University was the medical one. And uh, do any of his ideas bear on, on that uh, uh, commercial activity of uh, producing doctors? I, I don't know if I'm suggesting that that's true or anything, but it could be seen uh, maybe as servicing an outside profession. It does not it does not perturb his his thoughts about the university. Maybe I could just say a word here, um, coming from Boston College, which is um, a large Catholic liberal arts institution. In the US, generally speaking, one doesn't enter into the professions until the postgraduate stage. So law and medicine are postgraduate disciplines. Um, and I think um, maybe, you know, that's a very big difference to what um, now is the case in European universities. Uh, where one enters to be a dentist or a um, agricultural scientist at 18 uh, or medicine and graduates, you know, around 25 or 24 or less. <clears throat> There's quite a difference between the US and Europe in that regard. And I think Newman's idea of the university was the liberal arts formation first. Uh, it is true that he was working on uh, the medical school and so on. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I'd like to hear what Paul has to say on that or actually uh, uh, Colin, because they may know more about the relationship between the two um, sides, the professional and the, uh, the, uh, for, the, the, the intellectual formation. Well, in order to boost the numbers going into medicine, um, science and engineering, Newman offered um, two years free um, fees for the people to, to encourage them to do the liberal arts course first. So that's one important point. Another fact is the, uh, even if they were doing, he didn't manage to get the law off the ground, I've got to say, um, but he reckoned that every time a group of students, as he says somewhere in the idea, sit down to each other over a meal, they're giving lectures one to the other, they're adjusting positions, they're gaining in and they were able to put their subject into the whole of, of knowledge together. So even that uh, mutual learning, which was going on from student to student, would also fill out a liberal education, even if they were doing something like engineering or medicine. I think one of the reasons medicine, the medical school was so successful was because they were given licentiates by the College of Surgeons and the degree that they would have got from the Catholic University, I don't think would have been recognized. And I that just brings up how worthy degrees, qualifications in other areas from the Catholic University recognized. They weren't. <laughs> it's the short answer to that question. Did they really? I didn't know that. So retrospectively. Yes. The Royal University was a degree that in body literature is nature. Much later, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, I have a question for Meta. Um, we've talked a lot just now about Newman and the we've started talking about Newman in the contemporary university. I wonder whether Edith Stein's 
slightly different. You you gave an interesting list at the end of how the slight differences, the important differences. This was more important because there's because they're slight because they're as it were informed by a reading of the meaning. How any of those might feed into this conversation about the contemporary university? Well, I think maybe first and foremost, her idea that the discussion of what the human being is belongs very centrally in the university. Um, I think that's something that would be generally maybe accepted even today, but it's certainly something we could, one could push a little, you know. Um, I think that Newman was also very interested in the individual person. And I think that his emphasis on the canon really has to do with recognizability more than with uh, its intrinsic value. So, uh, in, this, in the sense that today we see a pro proliferation, of course, of, of, of canons in that many types of literature are, are read in the name of diversification and, and so on. Um, so I don't know whether that would have eventually been a really big problem for, for Newman. It wouldn't for Stein. I mean, she's also 50 years later, 60 years later. So some of the evolution that has led us to now already was visible to her, of course. Uh, so so the, the, the idea that we're living in a pluralist world where, or in, in, where there are many opinions is, um, is, 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 is part of what would be the reason for education at all, and especially the reason for the university, I imagine. Actually, might take chair's prerogative and, and follow up if I could, because I've been meaning to ask all along when a gap came. One of the things I simply don't know, but it interests me, because I, I found, stumbled across the fact that Stein had done a, a translation years ago, and I was struck by it, but I never pursued it. What I would, if you know this, or you could say a bit about it, is what is the, the, the understanding in Germany about, I mean, Newman's works were being published, you're saying, is the, the idea is extremely, the idea is in circulation, these ideas are being discussed. She does do the work of translating it. That suggests she feels there's a need to translate, perhaps primarily her own personal need. But is, does she, it's, she, was commissioned. Yeah, she was commissioned to it. Yeah. So does she take, in her understanding of Newman, does she have a German starting point from which she departs? Or is there, is she very much working with the original text in English as she engages with it? Or is, is this something that there is a set German reading of the uh, of Newman's educational work or Newman's thinking by the time she picks up the first text? Newman apparently at the time, so 20s, experienced in Germany a, a very serious, not a renaissance, but a, a great popularity. So that was the reason why Stein's own translation of the idea wasn't published because the uh, another publication came first in the collected works mm -hmm. of Newman translated into German. Um, I don't know the German context well enough mm -hmm. to to know how Newman fed in, but I do think it's an interesting thing that she translated liberal education. Which could have been translated differently with yeah, we would say it was free. Yeah. Free education. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to me to interrupt you. Um, I I studied a little bit of the background to um, to, to Newman's assimilation within French theology of the 20th century and the to the 19th century before that. And it seems that the uh, the Germans were very interested, but the French took a lot of interest in Newman during his lifetime. Of course, the biography or portrait of Newman is written by a kind of Jews called um, Jew, I forgot his surname, but anyway, it's just a little sketch of him. Anyway, early on, they're interested in the Catholic revival in England, and they, they continue to have an interest throughout the 19th century. The Germans also had an interest but when Dollinger was um, kind of outlawed, as it were, they started getting very conservative until the beginning of the 20th century. And that's when they started looking at Newman again through French translation, because there was quite a lot of work done. Uh, Ramon, for example, and others. But not all of those were completely accurate. Uh, so there's an interesting development there. 
that French interest leads to German interest, but the Germans are actually a bit more careful about interpreting the human more accurately than the French did around the beginning of the 20th century. There's a lot of modern history interpretation. Curiosity was Stein aware of the period, which is the mistake of that Newman was actually a Jewish descent. That Newman was? That Newman was a Jewish descent. I think they were actually. Don't know. She, she wouldn't have been too interested. Well, it, it wasn't part of her. We have a question online from Philip, uh, who could join us potentially. If you could put at least your microphone on, Philip, and possibly your camera, if you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. But uh, my question is, um, listening to uh, this uh, very rich discussion, is what extent do you think Newman's thinking on the idea of university was influenced by Edmund Burke? Would anybody like to take that? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing Paul consult his index, <laughs> which suggests to me that he might have an answer to the question. And he's shaking his head, no, work is not in the index. No, there are two mentions of him in my critical edition of the idea. So I, very little in other words. Mm -hmm. may, I, may, may I say something which um, Please. just sort of posed the question further. Uh, this summer, um, I reread the idea of a university, and I've long been aware that a theme of the idea of the university is usurpation. And uh, the usurpation of uh, more traditional disciplines. And I also happened this summer, I set myself, I was directing a summer school at Merton College in Oxford, I uh, was there for three weeks with no television. So I set myself the task of reading um, Edmund Burke's reflections on the idea of, a French, of the French Revolution. And the theme of usurpation comes through very strongly in Burke. I think the word is actually in the final paragraph of uh, Burke's work. Uh, and of course, Burke is challenging uh, that theoretic uh, understanding of uh, life and thought and culture and politics. And it seemed to me that with Newman picking up on this theme of the usurpation of uh, traditional discipline in the university, he may have been recognizing a debt to Edmund Burke. And in the context of the Catholic university there in Ireland, I just wondered whether others had sort of sensed that and picked up on it. Yeah, <laughs> Daniel has pointed at you and says, you know the answer. <laughs> I've confirmed that you know the answer, Jeremy. Uh, actually, I don't know the answer about Edmund Burke, but I was just thinking, in fact, it's more like the, the truth is that Maynooth University was set up largely to counteract the influence of the French Revolution and Irish uh, Catholic seminarians going to France and coming back inculcated with uh, um, French revolutionary ideas. So in general, Maynooth was seen as a very conservative um, establishment uh, university throughout the uh, first half of the 19th century anyway. It started later on, there was arguments. Pierce has arguments about this uh, when he's setting up his own idea of education. And, and Patrick Pierce is actually a very interesting figure here. Um, he taught Irish, I gather, in, uh, in the very house, uh, Newman House, where you are now. Uh, but um, I don't think... I, I don't, I, my own view is that I don't think, Bur I don't remember Burke being ever referred to by Newman. Uh, so I don't know if there's any direct uh, relationship. Newman, going back to an earlier remark about Newman's popularity in Germany, is partly because Newman was seen or is presented there as a modernizer. In fact, Edith Stein was recommended to read him by her uh, confessor who was a Polish uh, priest, uh, 
very Prishvar, Prishvara or some name. I'm never able to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. But he had written a book on Shaler and Newman. So he was linking Newman with um, Max Shaler, a kind of very modernizing uh, Catholic for a period. So I think- And idea... also, of course, uh, uh, as a compendium of Newman, a very famous yes. compendium. Yes, he did, a, he did that compendium. Yes. And, and I think the, the idea there was because uh, was to present Newman as a modernizing force against the neo-scholasticism that was also emerging in European um, Catholic Newman history. was never a scholastic. Yes. But, I, I mean, if, if my hearing of Newman on the theme of usurpation, usurpation in many respects is a, is a much more important theme in the idea of a university than things like the idea of a gentleman, which is pure irony, it's just playing with that. Uh, it, it, it... <laughs> For the record, that was Daniel, <laughs> uh, who has usurped Philip's uh, remarks. Philip, so we apologize for that. I don't think we can get fast enough. So we are coming up on time. So I'll make one quick remark and take one last question. If I could, uh, on, the, on the question of Burke, or Philip, uh, now no longer with us, uh, that the late Seamus Dean wrote a, su a sustained piece on Burke's influence on the Catholic and wider world in this period, which might give you some of the clues you're looking for, that Burke certainly was widely read in Irish Catholic circles. Archbishop Cullen, for example, was very fond of Burke and said lovely things. Of course, they went to the same school, although not at the same time. Angela, please, the last question. Very quickly, uh, Matt is surprised that Newman translated liberal education as by that theory. But liberal means that the education of the free man, liberal, as opposed to the slave. So that's an that idea that comes from system. So that's the original meaning of liberal. So it means free education in the sense of education of the person. True. So liberal. It's a correct translation. Well, in a sense it is, in a sense it is, but, but liberal has this interesting connotation of being politically free. And I discovered in Queen Christina of Sweden, somebody was theorized liberalitas. And in fact, it was one of those medieval virtues that you you see in the mirror of princes. And Christina writes a mirror to herself, so to speak. And in liberalitas is the virtue that allows you to rule, which of course it also is in the other mirrors of princes. Um, and that means remain free with people obeying you. So you're liberal, you give away a lot of stuff in order to have command of your army or your nobles or whatever. So the liberal education also actually has that, in it. that's the gentleman thing, that if you, you have to be in charge of your environment as well as um, being free, but but I think that you could have translated better into German than with Freie, and and I think that Freie, it, it it's a it's a it's a translation in Stein's sense of of actually also translating it into a new gear. <laughs> it, it, she means it. it. It's it's better to say free because it, the the freedom that 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 the university should aim for it is not. The freedom to command, to command your followers. It is the freedom to be free. Uh, I probably disagree with you on that one. I might, I might say, <laughs> and that's a wonderful way to finish with <laughs> friendly disagreements. And thank our guests before we get locked in, please. Thank you. Thank you.